Tonight on Super Size vs Super Skinny, Dr Christian takes a ride on a bus that's helping Texans battle the bulge. This is the lap band wagon. It's a mobile gastric band service. It brings a whole new meaning to the term on the bandwagon. Back in the UK, super skinny coffee addict Dougie checks into the feeding clinic. To me, eating food is an inconvenience. And swaps diets with supersized comfort eater Julie. I'm feeling a bit sick off this coffee. And former anorexia sufferer Emma Wolfe investigates the importance of early diagnosis of an eating disorder. If you don't get treatment with at least a year, you're just leaving it too late because it becomes so big. It just becomes more part of you than you are yourself. Welcome to Super Size versus Super Skinny. Last year, 1,316 Brits had gastric band surgery to help lose weight. In the US, that figure was a staggering 58,000. In Texas, the number of people having gastric bands and the sheer size of the state has led to a new service hitting the streets to help cope with the bariatric boom. This is a unique service that you can only find in America. This is the lap band wagon. It's a mobile gastric band unit. Anyone who's had a gastric band fitted will need to have it adjusted from time to time to cope with the changes that naturally occur. And this service does just that. The lap band wagon is a fully equipped modern theater with the latest technology, including x-ray machines. This is going to go around your waist. This procedure involves a little bit of radiation. And just to protect me and my sperm, I have to wear a lead-lined garment to um, stop them being damaged by the radiation, hence the fetching metal kilt. Parked up in a local car park, the lap band wagon opens its doors to the first patients of the day. Teresa and her mother, Vicky, both have gastric bands, and Teresa's having hers adjusted. All right, Miss Teresa, we're going to have you step up. Teresa had a gastric band fitted two and a half years ago. Since then, she's lost over five stone. So how's it been going? It's been going really good. And I just think that the holidays are coming up, and I don't want to do what I sometimes do, which is overeat. OK, so we're going to do a little bit of adjustment bit, today. Yeah. OK. Yes, a lap band has a little area under the skin that you can access via a needle yes. to inject some saline to some salt water, right. and that can make the band bigger, or you can suck a bit out and make it a bit looser, depending on if you want to eat more or less, right? Right. And is yes. this a decision that you make yourself? Yes. It's not a doctor-driven decision. You decide, no. I want it a bit tighter or a bit looser. Yes. This is the band. Sure. And this is her actual port. Yeah. And it lays right here in this area. And if you feel down, you can feel. Can I have a feel? Uh-huh. My hands are cold, so there it is. Right, yeah, you feel the port. Yeah. This here is her band. You can see the tubing as it goes all the way down to the port. Teresa's in safe hands. Not only is Nurse Dakota an expert, but she too has had bariatric surgery. Were you very big as well? I was. Really? And have you had this procedure? I had the um, sleeve. You had a gastric, a gastric sleeve. sleeve. A gastric sleeve is an operation where a section of the stomach is surgically removed, reducing the size of the stomach by three quarters. That's a bit more drastic. It is. A lot more it's drastic, actually. A lot actually. more permanent. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's no going back. But you don't regret doing that either? Absolutely not. When a gastric band is adjusted, the area around the port is anaesthetized, and with the help of an x ray, saline fluid is added to the band to tighten it. This reduces the size of the stomach pouch and so reduces the amount of food that can be consumed. Okay. And what sort of a difference? Just the tiny amount that you've injected, what sort of a difference will that make to her? Just a couple of little drops could actually occlude her. So close the band up completely? Yes, I see. Job done. Thank you. That wasn't too bad, was it? Oh, no, it's never bad. Good. Uh. <laughs> The demand for this private healthcare service is growing. The cost to fit a gastric band is around eight and a half thousand dollars. That's just over five thousand pounds, which includes a year's worth of adjustments. Additional adjustments are paid for by the patients at a cost of hundred and fifty dollars, or ninety-three pounds a go. The patients seem happy, but Dr. Christian has concerns about the rise in weight loss surgeries on both sides of the pond. 
A mobile service like this does seem to be working well, and this may well be the future for America. And it's certainly very useful for the patients. It makes life easier for them. But is it making life a little bit too easy so that people no longer have to try to do anything for themselves? But what really concerns me is that back home in the UK, the NHS simply cannot afford it. And if the lap bandwagon comes calling in your neighbourhood, you know things have got worryingly out of control. Back in the UK, Dr Christian doesn't want us to emulate the US. So in an attempt to avert our impending weight crisis, he's brought together eight super sizers and eight super skinnies, who he'll pair up and send off to the feeding clinic for two days. There, they'll swap diets and confront their terrible eating habits. Julie, come and join me over here. So you are going to be diet swapped with Dougie. Yeah, nice to meet you. I thought it would be you, to be honest. Not too okay. bad. Not that bad. Not That's all right. I am quite lazy. Right. So a lot of the food that you'll be eating is sort of coming from a packet, not fresh. I'm quite good at cooking. I love cakes, cupcakes. I make about 200 a week. Do you? Yeah. When I saw Julie, I was quite shocked at the size of her compared to myself. So instantly I just thought it's going to be a challenge. When I first saw Dougie, I thought he looked a bit thin. <laughs> and the only thing I'd be worried about is he only has small portions and he doesn't like cakes. <laughs> Julie comfort eats and snacks constantly on sweet and fatty foods, whereas Dougie hardly eats at all and he uses coffee as a substitute for food. I'm hoping that by bringing them together, they'll find a healthier way forward from these bad habits. For 20 Stone 12 super snacker Julie Henry, eating is a round-the-clock activity. I love food a lot because it makes me happy. I have a very sweet tooth. I love things like cakes, especially cakes with cream in them. I like things like wine gums, jelly babies, hard-boiled sweets like lollipops. But there's one fatty, savoury snack she absolutely adores. I love crisps. Um, I'll eat about three or four packets at one go. Julie also likes a furtive feast, and when she's alone, her calorie consumption goes through the roof. That's when I do my, my secret eating. When I open the fridge, it's like your friend. Mm, what have we got in today? And it's like talking back to you because it's like saying, I'm here, I want to be eaten. She comfort eats because a lot of the time she's on her own. She's actually had to put a label on the uh, fridge door to uh, stop her. The label says, no snacking. <laughs> Even after the constant snacking, she still finds space for a colossal slap-up meal. My portion sizes aren't small. Usually I'll have a plate and I pile it up high the food and then I'll probably go for seconds. <laughs> Julie believes her bad eating habits got worse after family bereavement. I tend to put quite a bit of weight on when mum passed away. A lot of it is comfort eating, and then I've had quite a few um, people passing away. So for me to deal with um, grief is to eat. On the outside, I'm quite a, a bubbly person, always smiling. But on the inside, when I'm not around anybody, I'm like, munching on things. I worry about my health, and I worry about me future because a lot of my family have died quite young in the 50s and I'm 47 so I'm always looking like a head sort of thing. I want to be around for my little boy when he grows up. Whilst Julie's comfort eating is making it difficult for her to battle the bulge, the opposite is true of our super skinny. Nearly six foot and just nine stone three, super skinny Dougie Reed is a self-confessed coffee addict who relies on caffeine and nicotine as a substitute for food. I don't think about food throughout the day. I don't really get hungry easily. It just doesn't interest me at all, to be honest. I know that I should have breakfast, but because I'm not hungry, I won't eat any. I normally have three cups of coffee, 
three cigarettes. And to be honest, that normally satisfies me. I'm a hairdresser. I work in a busy salon. OK, so what are we doing for you today? My job does play a big part in my diet and what I eat on a daily basis because I just physically don't have enough time to eat throughout the day. But I'll always have time to have a coffee and a cigarette because to me that's more satisfying. In between clients, the first thing that I'll do is put the kettle on to make a coffee and while the kettle's on, I'll be having a cigarette. I probably have about 10 to 15 cups of coffee a day. Lunchtime, I tend to get something quite quick and easy, such as a sandwich or a sausage roll. But depending on how busy I am, a lot of the time I only get a couple of bites and then I might have to leave it or bin it. When I do have dinner, usually it's something quick and easy that I either put in a microwave or that I add hot water to that tends to come from a packet. Constantly suppressing his appetite with coffee and cigarettes has meant that Dougie's body is starting to call time on his unhealthy lifestyle. I know that I don't eat enough. I do get out of breath quite easily and I only sleep for about five to six hours a night, which I think is due to the amount of coffee that I drink throughout the day. Dr Christian will have his work cut out with these two, but before they enter the feeding clinic, he's sending Julie to America for a glimpse into her possible future should she keep piling on the pounds. It's a big journey for me. I feel a bit nervous, butterflies, sort of excited, but nervous at the same time. Comfort eater and snacker Julie Henry is in Spring Hill, Tennessee to meet a big man who, like her, has a huge craving for sweet things. Julie will get a disturbing vision of what could happen if she doesn't change her diet. My name is Charles Cook. I'm 28 years old and I weigh 38 stone. I do have high blood pressure. I was diagnosed with that when I was about 22 years old. And as anybody would know, that's insanely young to be diagnosed with high blood pressure. It's definitely related to my weight. It makes it uncomfortable to walk when you're really heavy just because you get out of breath easy. I've also had what is called venous stasis ulcers. They're ulcers in your legs, and they're very painful, and that's also weight-related. My brother, we are identical twins. We were born two minutes apart. He is the same size as I am. My mom was a single mom. She had to work two or three jobs a lot of times, and my sister was at home with us. You become accustomed to having nothing but junk food because it's cheaper. <laughs> I do have a wife, and I have a son, Braden, who is seven years old. I worry about him having a heart attack or not being around for Braden. If he doesn't take better care of himself, his doctor has told him that he probably won't be around in 10 years, and that really scares me. After a 10-hour flight, Julie's uncertain about what lies ahead. My hands are sweaty and um, I'm feeling nervous. I don't know what to expect. Hi, Julie. All right, Charles. How are nice you? Nice to meet you. Would you like something to drink, Julie? Yes, please. Like Julie, Charles has a sweet tooth. I really like baking and pastry, which was my... Well, I like making cupcakes. I'd rather have a piece of cake than a dinner. I would rather eat dessert before I eat dinner. Yeah. He's big, and I can see he gets out of breath a lot. I don't want to get that big. Charles takes Julie into town for some light refreshment. This is our favorite place to come. I do particularly like ice cream. That's one of my most favorite things. I can eat a lot of ice cream. So what's your favorite one? I like the cake batter. This is very good. Now over here they have all different kinds of candy toppings. Do you see any toppings you want to get? All of them. <laughs> see, they have fruit and stuff, but if you're standing in front of gummy bears, you don't want fruit. <laughs> Can't beat sweets. <laughs> 
Like Julie, Charles has a young son, but being physically active with an energetic seven-year-old isn't easy when you're 38 stone. I'd like to be able to play with them, but it's hard to when you're overweight. Yeah. You want to be the best parent possible, but how can you be when you can't run with them and, and play with them? Like, I'm getting out of breath a bit now. Yeah. So I yeah. want to get to that stage where yeah, you can't no... take them out anymore. But if they both continue with their unhealthy diets, enjoying all the pleasures of parenthood will become impossible. Dr. Christian doesn't want that to happen, and unbeknown to the supersized duo, he's nearby. Charles, at the age of 22, was diagnosed as pre-diabetic. Charles has a family history of diabetes. It's very likely he will end up with diabetes because of his weight. Julie fears that she will go that way, and I'm hoping that she'll learn from Charles that this isn't a great future for her. It definitely is one of the reasons that... Well, 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 well. Look who we've got here. And you're Charles. I am. Charles, I'm Christian. Good to meet you, Christian. I'm the doctor that's going to be looking after this lady. All right. I wanted to ask you, how do you feel about your weight currently? Not happy about it. I mean, it's um, it's one of those things where, almost like a drug, where you, you're you happy in the moment, and then when you're done eating, I mean, you know that you shouldn't have had it. You always yeah. feel guilty. Yeah, you feel guilty. But mm -hmm. it makes you... It, it's, it's happy in a way. I mean, you've heard of various eating disorders like anorexia and bulimia, yeah. but we're sort of expanding those criteria into covering binge eating disorders. And it's a very real condition. I think we're getting a better understanding of these sorts of problems now, which is a good thing. As well as delving into the psychological reasons behind overeating, back at Charles's house, Dr. Christian also wants to address their health concerns, and it leads to a shocking revelation. My legs. Uh, swelling up a lot more. Well, leg ulcers is something that I wanted to talk to you about because this chap here knows all about leg ulcers, don't you? That. Oh, that's bad. That's mm. pretty shocking, isn't it? Mm. It hurts. <laughs> Would do. Yeah. Healing is a nightmare because the blood supply is not very good. Sorry. So this is what yeah. we call a venous ulcer, venous yeah, stasis venous ulcer. Stasis ulcer. Mm, when you so, take that off. And... It smells quite strong. Yeah. And this may never heal. Probably not whilst he stays the size that he is. Dr Christian wants to find out if his shock tactics are really working. So you're already developing sort of no, problems with your legs? Just not quite ulcer stage yet, but... No. But they're not looking great, are they? No. But you know what you can do about those, don't you? Yeah. It's a wake-up point. Yeah, it really is. Yeah. And I want you to see how if you just let things go and go and go, that could be exactly yeah. how you are. Coming here, I think, has been really, really emotional for Julie. I think now she realises she hasn't got a lot of time left to turn things around. It's time for Julie to head home. Goodbye. Goodbye. The hard work is about to start. It was a shock seeing his leg. It's made me think a lot more about um, the way I'm eating, cos I wouldn't want to face those things. I haven't met her son, but he doesn't deserve to grow up with a mom that is sick or losing a mom at an early age. So I hope she can complete her goal and, and, and be there for him. Back in the UK, cereal snacker Julie is checking into the feeding clinic to confront her out-of-control diet. Joining her is super skinny Dougie, whose disinterest in food and dependence on coffee is putting his health at risk. But before they begin their two-day diet swap, Dr Christian wants to delve deeper into their disastrous diets to find out where they're going wrong. At 9 stone 3, Dougie's calorie intake is 1,900 a day, the equivalent of a seven-year-old boy, and much of that doesn't come from solid food. I'm not going to pester you this week about stopping smoking, all right? What I am going to concentrate on over the next few days is cutting down your caffeine addiction and I hope replaced with food and I want you to try as hard as you can to sort of go cold turkey and eat as much of the food as you can because that will boost your metabolism. When you leave here you will actually leave feeling hungry, believe it or not, having eaten a lot, a lot more than you've ever eaten before. And instead of then just going and suppressing that hunger with a coffee and a fag, I want you to eat and keep that eating up and that's how you will see results. Whilst coffee addict Dougie needs to replace his liquid diet with more solid food, clandestine comfort eater Julie needs to cut down on the calories. She's eating enough for three healthy adult women, 
with a calorie intake of 5,517. So since you got back, you've had some medical news, haven't you? And your blood tests and things have shown that you're borderline diabetic. Yeah, that was, that was a big concern. Probably understands why I wanted to eat sweets all the time. If you can lose the weight, I think your blood sugars will stabilise and come down, and the threat of diabetes will be far less. So you're going to have to learn a little bit of self-control, and it's to do with self-worth and self-esteem. You're going to say no because you value yourself and you value your health better than that. Judy's discipline is about to be tested because it's time for Super Size and Super Skinny to swap diets in the hope that watching another person grapple with what they eat will kick-start a healthier approach to food. First up for breakfast skipping Dougie is a very unsupersized meal of cereal and a cup of tea with one sugar and semi-skimmed milk. And for Julie, a caffeine kick of three cups of coffee with two sugars in each and a splash of semi-skimmed milk. Let's try this. See, it just doesn't... Look appealing to me at all, this. But if Dougie thinks this is a taste of what's to come, he's mistaken. Just two hours later, it's mid-morning snack time. A large chicken sandwich with lots of butter, a family pack of crisps and mayonnaise, both high in saturated fat, and lots of sugar in the form of cola and some boiled sweets, and even more fatty crisps. But for Julie's rumbling tummy, it's disappointment. More coffee. More coffee. More we did buzzing off the last <laughs> lot. I just feel like it's nothing there. <laughs> so I'm definitely going to be rumbling tonight. <laughs> See, that looks more appetising. Because of the amount, I feel full already just from looking at it. But I'm used to half a sandwich and a packet of crisps. Right. <clears throat> so I think it's the portion that's thrown me. Quite a lot. Well, I'm always snacking all the time. Oh, yeah? Yeah, I'd eat all those crisps. How do you feel when you've had this? Happy. Do you? <laughs> yeah. And I sort of secretly eat at home because nobody sees me eating it, so I think, well, if they haven't seen me, they don't know what I've eaten. Do you think if you did see yourself eating all this, do you think you'd see a different side of it? It does make me think about it. I didn't realise how much I eat. Is it the amount that upsets you? Or... It's just like, it's my little world. Because um, I've looked after other people throughout the, the years. It's like a comfort to me, food. It was always like happy feelings to me. When you see it all set out, it does look quite a bit. You sort of feel like, I suppose, disgusted, really, what, you've, what you sort of eat. Dr Christian wants to delve a little deeper into the emotional upheaval that's led Julie to comfort eating. She opens up about a personal tragedy that she's still coming to terms with. Because I moved my son, mm. uh, and I probably got a bit of post nasal depression but didn't know I got it. And then when I had my second son and he died, um, that got, I got really low on that. Um, and it, it got to a stage where I didn't even know I was getting low until other people told me. Do you think you're still properly... Grieving. Grieving? Probably, yeah. you think you've got over it yet? Uh, I have, sort of, but it's always there. You know, I want you to know that these sorts of things are not always easy to sort out yourself, and actually asking for a bit of help would be no bad thing. I think, you know, exploring the reasons why you turn to food, it, this may well be one of them. It's that deep, gnawing sadness that you have that's completely explainable. Yeah. And I think you just need a little more help getting over that. Let's go inside, come on. Dr Christian wants to spend time with Dougie too. For the first time in years, Dougie's gone for a whole morning without coffee. He wants him to reduce his craving for caffeine, so he's going to show him the health risks associated with a life fueled by coffee. So come along into here. And um, come and stand over by this table. That is the amount of coffee you drink in a week. Really? Really. 91 cups of coffee a week. I'm shocked at it being this many. And from a calories point of view, 
sugar. That's 728 grams of sugar. That's a week's worth of sugar that you're putting in your week's worth of coffee. Medically, though, this is a powder called tannic acid or tannin, and it's what gives tea and coffee this brown colour that stains your clothes when you spill it on it, and it gives it that sort of slightly tangy taste on your tongue that actually is why people drink tea and coffee, is what they like about it. This has an unfortunate downside to it. It inhibits your absorption of iron. So you have a diet that's already deficient in iron. You have this stuff preventing any further absorption of iron from your gut. Iron deficiency causes a whole host of problems to your body, particularly skin problems like this one. What you can see is a nasty, eczematous reaction. It's this sort of peeling, dry, quite painful-looking skin, and that's a result of iron deficiency. It also causes changes to your tongue. You can get a very big, red, sore tongue that leaves you feeling tired. You have very little exercise tolerance, so climbing up and down the stairs can leave you feeling exhausted. It's shocking. I didn't realise drinking coffee can do that to you. I want you to be very clear. It's not coffee that's bad. It's the quantity of coffee as a substitute for food in an otherwise already very, very poor diet that's going to lead to these sorts of problems. So I want you to spend some time now thinking about how you can convert all those cups of coffee and the time it takes you to make a fag into getting meals in during the day, which are going to be so much better for you. All right? Because my appearance is important to me, to know that if I don't change anything about my diet now, the effects that it could have on my skin and my health in the future, it terrifies me. It's day one of the diet swap. 20 stone 12 comfort eater Julie and 9 stone 3 coffee addict Dougie are sitting down to lunch. And for Julie, who's had nothing but coffee all morning, it can't come soon enough. I'm going to eat this quick cos I'm starving. <laughs> Julie tucks into a sausage roll and some cola. How does it feel to finally have some food today? It's good. <laughs> because my grit stomach was growling. Are you surprised at how long you've managed to go without having food? I'm just surprised that the amount that you actually eat is not a lot. Dougie's lunch of crisps, sweets, cranberry juice and a tortilla wrap with tuna onions and peppers leads to a confession about his five a day. It is the first time, I'd say at least in six months to a year, that I've eaten it veg. To you. It's nice, I am actually enjoying it. Dougie's beginning to realise how poor his diet really is. It doesn't seem a lot at all that I do eat. Are you full? No. <laughs> <laughs> Julie and Dougie are settling down to dinner. On the menu tonight for Dougie are poached eggs on toast with lashings of full-fat butter, fried sausages, more crisps just to add to the calorie count, and a muffin covered in icing, which is one of cake fanatic Julie's favourite treats. For our supersizer, it's more coffee and plain noodles straight from a packet. And she's not impressed. It's like eating worms. <laughs> <laughs> so that's how I like them. It seems like that you like quick and easy meals. I used to really enjoy trying different foods. I used to help my parents cook sometimes. But I think because I'm just cooking for myself, you don't want to put as much effort into it. Dougie may lack culinary skills, but after just one day of the diet swap, he's rediscovering his appetite. I feel as if the more I'm eating, the hungrier I am. Julie's also discovered something. My stomach's not rumbling as much now. So it does prove that you don't have to have a large portion to feel satisfied. And I don't need all them crisps. <laughs> <laughs> Is your relationship with crisps finished now? Yeah. yeah. Day two of the diet swap, which Dr Christian hopes will force Dougie and Julie to get to grips with their terrible diets. It's breakfast which means no food for Julie, just a triple shot of coffee, each with two sugars. For Dougie, who skipped breakfast for years, it's more carbohydrates and sugar. His bowl of cereal, toast with butter and jam, and a cup of tea is enough to push him over the edge. I'm already starting to feel quite full. I think when you have such a big portion, it sort of overwhelms you. But the deluge of dishes continues.
just two hours after breakfast, he's confronted with another one of Julie's supersized snacks. There's a plate of sticky spare ribs, a large cola, a sweet iced coffee, and a couple of straight coffees, and yet more crisps. Again, I'm overwhelmed at how much is there. Julie has to settle for two cups of coffee, but as Dougie tackles his elevensies, he raises concerns about the greasy ribs. Does it worry you how much fat is just in this alone? I've never looked at it like that before. It's just something to eat and nice. <laughs> Julie's beginning to wake up to the damage her diet's doing to her health. And more than anyone, she should understand the risks of a bad diet. A lot of my family's died quite young, so I want to be around for my family, yeah. Beginning to understand the deep emotional and psychological factors behind her poor relationship with food is a key step to help Julie change. But for the 1.6 million people in the UK living with an eating disorder, getting better can be a long and painful journey. In this series of reports, journalist and former anorexic Emma Wolfe has been taking an inside look into the world of eating disorders. So far, she's investigated anorexia running in the family. I think I got an eating disorder because my mum was suffering from an eating disorder. Developing anorexia during pregnancy and men with eating disorders. For many years, I would binge and purge seven, eight times a day. Emma's now turning her attention to the importance of the early diagnosis of an eating disorder. Emma developed anorexia when she was 19, after a relationship ended. Her weight quickly fell from nine and a half to five and a half stone. Emma didn't seek help straight away not wanting to admit she had a problem and feeling that no one could help her. I didn't ask for help. For about a year, I didn't really see any medical professionals. So I didn't get help until it had already taken quite a powerful grip. In the UK, an estimated £1.26 billion a year is spent on the treatment of eating disorders. That figure is expected to double in the next 20 years. Many eating disorder professionals believe these enormous therapy and treatment costs could be reduced if eating disorders were diagnosed sooner. Emma is on her way to meet 59-year-old Pauline. Today I'm going to meet a lady who's battled with a range of eating disorders for over 40 years. What started out as simple anorexia has become something much more complex. She wasn't actually diagnosed until about 10 years ago. Um, and what I want to find out from her is whether she thinks an early diagnosis might have made a difference. My eating disorders have affected every single aspect of my life. In fact, they completely wrecked my life. I was first aware that I had an eating disorder when I was 14 and stopped eating. And at that time, being 1967, eating disorders was not something that anybody, I don't think, had actually heard of. It started off eating totally nothing and then stuffing and binging and purging and alternating between the two. Undiagnosed for 30 years, Pauline's anorexia developed into numerous different conditions. I was diagnosed so late, the eating disorder had become such a part of my normal day-to-day -day life that really it was um, just too late for me. I just can't imagine not having it. I don't want it. I want to get rid of it, but I don't know how to get rid of it. I don't want it to be there. Pauline is now trapped in an unhealthy routine where her life revolves around ritually preparing fresh foods. Just making breakfast takes three hours. If this was not me, I would think it was completely ludicrous. Emma meets Pauline at her favourite organic store. Hello, Emma, I'm Pauline. Good it's meet lovely you. to meet you. For years, I had this whole thing of going down the, the whole aisle of supermarkets, yeah. just looking at the cereals. Every single day of my life has been punctuated with this. The whole thing is about food. 
It's totally time consuming. I feel it's become a career. I have now the kind of benefit of hindsight of being able to see what a complete and utter waste of life it was. I completely messed up my system with all the laxatives and the purging and the fasting and the stuffing and all this. My, my stomach just didn't work. Do you ever stop to think about what it would have been like if you'd been diagnosed, say, when you were uh, 18, 19, and, and if you dealt with it then, how life could have been so different? It would have been completely different. I think, you know, if, if you don't get a diagnosis and some sort of treatment with at least a year, you're just leaving it too late because it just escalates and it becomes so big, it, it just becomes more part of you than you are yourself. That was quite scary, actually, just meeting Pauline and seeing what can happen if no one picks it up. I'm just wondering whether Pauline's a special case or whether late diagnosis really can cause that much damage. Eating disorders expert Professor Brian Lask understands the importance of early intervention. How could the situation be improved with early intervention? All my patients say this. The longer they're stuck with this illness, the harder it is to break it, even though they want to. At a certain point, as you know, you get so fed up with the illness, you just want to get rid of it. Yeah. But it's really difficult. So, obviously, inpatient care for people with eating disorders is very expensive. Yes. What are your concerns about funding? Anorexia is such a difficult illness to treat, and some people definitely need hospitalisation. Without it, they don't get better. And I see so many children and adolescents who have been denied inpatient care and become sicker and sicker. So, unfortunately, we're living in a time of false economy where the people who hold the funds are saying, oh, no, we can't afford this, it's not justified, and in so doing, make the situation much worse. Meeting Pauline and Professor Lask is a reminder of just how important early diagnosis is. Pauline's story in particular shows us just how severe eating disorders can become if they're not treated as soon as possible. When I get emails from readers, I always say to them, do seek help as soon as you can. Back at the feeding clinic, it's the last meal in the diet swap. And for Dougie, it's a sizeable supper of a chicken sandwich, chicken thighs, grapes, sweets, a Bakewell tart, a cup of tea, cordial, and the ever-present crisps. Versus a miniature meal of two coffees and noodles in a cup. For super size and super skinny, it's time to reflect. Looking at yours, it's a big portion, so hopefully I'll be really cutting down on my sizes and meals. I have learnt that I don't need a lot of food to fill full up. I have also learnt that you don't need food to comfort yourself. I found that I can eat more if I push myself. Dougie seems to be starting his new diet regime now, and he's determined to get on top of his mountain of food. You've done really well. I pushed myself a little bit further with this one because I know that my portions do have to increase, and I know that I'm only going to do that if I start doing that now. It's time for Dougie and Julie to leave the feeding clinic. All right, guys, come on in, because here I have your diet plans. Dougie, this one's yours. The main thing here really is caffeine and nicotine are not your friends. Good nourishing food is, OK? Julie, this one is yours. And really, with you, it's working out what that little gnawing feeling is inside. Is it boredom? Is it sadness? And what you can do to answer that, it's not eating. All right? Get on top of that, and I think you're going to do really well. And I wish you both the best of luck with it. OK? Over the next two months, I'm definitely eating a little bit more healthily. Also, bigger portions, maybe have them a little bit more regular. The little lad says um, he'd be helping me exercise a little bit more. And like I say, cutting down on the amount of food that I actually eat. Lovely to meet you, Julie. It was lovely to meet you too. Best and, of luck. And good luck. Thank you. It's been two months since comfort eater Julie and coffee addict Dougie left the feeding clinic. Time to find out if they've stuck to their healthy eating plans. I'm excited, also pretty nervous. I've tried really hard. 
It's probably one of the hardest things that I've had to do because I've had to change my lifestyle and I just hope that I get the result that I want, which is that I've gained weight. I'm feeling a bit nervous about the weigh in. I'm hoping I've lost above a stone, would be good. The diet plan's got me more motivated and people have noticed that it's made me a lot happier. Julie, hi, how are you? Nice right. to see you. Come and have a seat. You're looking very well. Yeah. <laughs> You're looking radiant, even. A lot happier. How have things been? Really good. A lot of people have said I've been a lot more happy in myself. Why do you think that is, that you're happier? Because I've changed meeting patterns. I'm eating more regular. And I'm not snacking at night. And I'm exercising a lot more, which has helped. Comfort eating, I think, was a real problem for you before. Can you see yourself going back to that, or do you think you've got over that now? No, I'm not, not going to go back to that. And so tell me how you're feeling physically, what's different? My legs aren't swelling up as much now at night. And I seem to be not out of breath as much. And um, then what about the future? So what are you going to do next? I definitely want to lose a few more stones. Mm -hmm. So that's my main aim. Good. Well, I think you've definitely got the right mindset and you are firmly on the right path now. So that's great news. Jilly, thanks for coming back. It's nice to All see right. you. Thank okay. you. Bye-bye. Dougie, hello. Yeah, nice Welcome back. Thank you. How are you doing? Really good, thank you. How has the diet plan been? It was hard to begin with. I had to obviously make a lot of changes. You um, did, indeed, a lot. Have you managed to do that, though? I have. The first thing that I do when I wake up is I'll have breakfast. And are you cooking more now? I am, yeah. I'm spending more time in the kitchen. I wouldn't say I'm a good cook. Getting there. Um, I'm getting there, yeah. Good. One of your big problems was that you drank an awful lot of coffee, which filled you up momentarily, but it also suppressed your appetite quite a lot. Yeah. And that kind of just about got you through your day, didn't it? Have you cut down on coffee? I have. I've cut down my coffee from sort of 12 to 14 cups to kind of three. That's a big difference. Three. Good. And so how are you feeling as a result of all this? Tell me. Um, I feel as if I've got more energy. I feel more confident. Um, both friends, family, clients have all said how well I'm looking. That's good news. Dougie, nice to see you. Thanks Thank for coming. Thank you. Bye-bye. Wow. Wow, <laughs> look at you. And our duo are reunited. <laughs> nice to see you. Oh, well, it's nice to see you again. <laughs> You're looking really, really well. And you're looking like you put a bit more on your face and on your oh, arms as well, arms. yeah. You seem a lot happier as well. Oh, I'm not happy. You've got a smile on your face. Yeah. Your appearance has changed a lot as well. I know I've got a shorter skirt on. Shorter skirt. <laughs> Getting a bit braver now. Yeah, I always used to just wear trousers. Yeah. You look really confident, you look lovely, yeah. a lot better and healthier. Hello, excuse me for butting in, but I just had to come and see you guys and say I'm a very happy doctor indeed with you two. Let me put you straight out of your misery, Dougie. I'm going to talk to you first. Yeah. Do you think you've put a bit of weight on? Yeah, I'd like to think I have. I feel better in myself. Good. You've put on half a stone in weight. Have I? That's quite impressive, all right? So just think you keep this up and add in and add in and add in what that's going to be like in six months or a year. Mm. It's good, isn't it? Yeah. And Julie, what do you think of that? That's excellent. So... I think he can be pleased. And what yeah. about you? Julie, well, I don't know what you've been up to. I really don't. You've lost two stone in weight. <laughs> you I have. didn't think it was that much. What Please. were you doing? Pleased with that. You should be more than pleased with that, because that is incredible. It's all that walking itself. It's everything yeah. that you've done. It's all the changes that you've made. Every little thing that you do will make a difference. I'm happy with that. You're crying, but you're happy, <laughs> yeah. right? I get it, I know. Well done. <laughs> done. I feel over the moon. My family's been a really big help. They've encouraged me to do a lot more walking, especially my son. I'm determined to keep going, because my goal is to lose another two stone. And that'd be sort of the weight that I was when I got married. I couldn't be happier. The changes that I made in my diet, I'm going to stick to. The next year or so, I'd like to see myself looking a lot more healthier, eating more, and going to the gym to start building up a bit of muscle.